This video is going to look at different aspects of quantification by XPS using an example of magnesium oxide. The reason that magnesium oxide is a good example for quantification of XPS is the stoichiometry is very simple between magnesium and oxygen. It should be one to one. Each of the peaks that we have from magnesium and oxygen are well separated so regions can be used to estimate peak areas. What is more that the magnesium peaks are either at very low kinetic energy or very high kinetic energy and the oxygen peaks sit somewhere in the middle. So any variation in signal intensity as a consequence of change in kinetic energy for the photo emission electrons will be easily observed by any quantification procedures that we apply to these data. Before proceeding to the steps required to quantify these data we'll have a look at the essential steps that are required to do quantification by XPS. So we have a relative sensitivity factor that describes how peak intensity above a background needs to be modified based on the physics of the photo emission process. We need to account for angular distribution variation and this is a geometrical relationship of the x-ray source to the direction that electrons are sampled by the instrument. There's the escape depth correction that is allowing for sample variation as a function of kinetic energy. That means that the escape depth from which electrons leave the sample without energy loss changes as a function of kinetic energy and therefore we have to allow for such variations in intensity especially for peaks such as the magnesium 1s compared to the magnesium 2s for example. And then finally we have the transmission characteristics and the transmission characteristics describe how signal originating at the sample moves through the analyzer and is recorded and how this might vary as a function of kinetic energy once again. So we have at least two operations here that depend on the kinetic energy of the electrons and this is why the magnesium oxide is a good example which tests these corrections. We'll now implement on these magnesium oxide data the quantification steps and the first thing we'll do is create regions that will define the relative sensitivity factors for these peaks. So we'll use the element library and the element library includes a list of photo emission lines and the relative sensitivity factors for example this magnesium 1s is 11.18 so this corresponds to the intensity that we'd expect this magnesium 1s peak to appear at relative to a carbon 1s which is set with a relative sensitivity factor of unity so having invoked the quantification parameters dialog window the regions property page topmost if I select the zoom when line selected and create when line selected and I click on the magnesium 1s then a region is created and I can adjust this region so that it calculates the area above the background and because I created the region using the element library the relative sensitivity factor has been brought in for the survey spectrum and this particular magnesium 1s interval. So we'll repeat this for the oxygen 1s clicking on the spectrum this will scroll the element library and by selecting the oxygen 1s with create line selected the relative sensitivity factor and an interval representing a region where the signal above background for the oxygen 1s is calculated and then we have a pair of peaks that should be enough to characterize the magnesium oxide. So if I add a quantification table this should be in the ratio of 1 to 1 and also I can use the text annotation to create a formula and it will be displayed using the live formula from the quantification table so it's going to use information from this table in order to present a text string that is characteristic of the relationship between magnesium and oxygen. 
So as it stands, you can see that this now looks like we've got a one-to-one -one relationship, which is what you'd expect for magnesium oxide. The quantification results here of one-to-one, -one, or close to one-to-one -one anyway, have been achieved by using Schofield cross-sections. So let's now look at the other corrections that are involved in producing this quantification as you see it here. On the Regions Property page, the indication at the bottom here is that we've used a magic angle instrument. Actually, they're both S orbitals, so it really doesn't matter whether it's a magic angle instrument or not. S orbitals will always have the same relationship. It's only when you have PDF does it make a difference if you have a non-magic angle instrument. And the other correction is the escape depth correction, which is effective attenuation length. And the tick here indicates that we have a transmission function active. So let's now remove these corrections. So I'm first of all going to turn the escape depth correction off. And also I'm going to turn off the transmission function. And without the transmission function and without the escape depth correction, it's quite clear that the quantification that you obtain from these data are not the expected stoichiometry. If I add the transmission correction, the, the relationship appears to worsen in the sense that it's now 1 to 3 instead of 1 to 1. And it's not until I add the escape depth correction of the effective attenuation length that the relationship then looks like one to one. So the transmission function, if I do control page up, you can see the nature of the transmission function that's been added to these data. So relative to zero, you can see that you have a transmission function that does vary. And one of the things to note is that the rate of change of the transmission increases at these lower kinetic energies. As a rule, peaks in the lower kinetic energy range are the most uncertain in terms of peak area and how they relate to other parts of the spectrum. The transmission clearly has an influence on the quantification. However, in this case, because we have very low kinetic energy and very high kinetic energy peaks, the escape depth makes an important contribution to get obtaining the correct stoichiometry for this magnesium oxide. So let's have a look at what happens when you have escape depth correction. So escape depth correction is considering the volume from which photoemission can occur. At different kinetic energies, the photoemission can come from ever increasing depths as the kinetic energy increases. So if you had a photoemission process that was occurring at the same rate at different kinetic energies, then the size of these photoemission peaks would vary because the depth sampled due to the escape depth changes with each kinetic energy. Hence, without such a correction, the quantification makes little sense. Both the transmission and the escape depth represent adjustments that are based on the kinetic energy of the photoemission lines. And since magnesium comes with a set of three photoemission peaks over a wide range of kinetic energy, then one of the tests that we ought to do is confirm that our corrections are giving us reasonable answers for these magnesium peaks. Because if we can't demonstrate that this magnesium 1s is in the right proportion to these other magnesium peaks, it would be difficult to trust the quantification from the oxygen with this 1s. To investigate these magnesium peaks, I've created a file where I've copied the survey spectrum twice. And on these two survey spectra, I've created regions. And the first one has got three regions that have been designed using a background type, which is a spline linear. And this allows you to make small adjustments to the shape of this background in order to adjust 
the background until you get something that is in some sense more reasonable given the quantification that we're performing here. So I've got three backgrounds, three peaks, and they each have slightly different shapes to their backgrounds and these shapes are required to get a quantification that is what you'd expect, namely one to one to one, because these are all from the same material. So we'd expect these peaks, when scaled according to the escape depth, the transmission, and the Schofield cross sections, we would expect these to produce the same amount of magnesium, regardless of which one of these peaks that we, we use. Now if I paste back an oxygen region, then again using a spline background and some license in how I've defined the background once again it does illustrate that with the right background shapes these corrections do produce what you'd expect so there's the same amount of oxygen as you'd expect from each one of these that's because it's MGO so does this make sense to introduce backgrounds that have some kind of shape like along these lines. You can see here, in order to achieve this quantification, I've had to use a concave up background for the magnesium 2S, whereas for the magnesium 2P, I have a concave down background. So to justify this, I've performed a second analysis of the same data, and this time I've introduced a two-gar background that is calculating inelastic scattered electron yield as a consequence of these photoemission peaks. And you can see that, I'll just move to here so that we can zoom in without adjusting the region. So you can see that the Tugar background is illustrating that the concave down nature of the background beneath the magnesium 2P is a result of this oxygen 2s. So this is a background structure that is resulting from a different photo emission line and similarly you can see that the magnesium 2s peak has a concave up background associated with it. So this is an approximation that is trying to illustrate how inelastic scattering would distribute photo emission as a result of electrons moving through the material before emerging into the vacuum. And this is consistent with what we're seeing here. It may not be precisely the same, but you can see that the same nature of the background is required in order to produce a quantification that makes sense. So taken as a whole, this would suggest that we, we do have corrections that are appropriate for these data, that the transmission function is within reason, the effective attenuation length is also within reason and the Schofield cross-sections return values that make sense in terms of the material itself. Now there's one other point that I should make here is that there is a carbon 1s peak and you might think that this could imply a surface contamination of some description on the magnesium oxide. However, the magnesium oxide was mixed with carbon black as a conducting material that has only carbon, very, very small oxygen peak. So the measurement was performed not on pure magnesium oxide, but a combination of magnesium oxide and carbon black. And as a result, no charge compensation was used. And the carbon is in spatially distinct places from the magnesium oxide. So we can compare the magnesium oxide results with a degree of confidence that we do not have a significant amount of contamination here.